production underwriting for Ruckus has been made possible in part by the generous contributions from Fred and Lou Hartwig and from viewers like you. Thank you. Well, exactly. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. Now let's meet the fearless, peerless, panelless <laughs> pundits known as the Ruckettes. Yale Abahaka is an editorial writer and columnist for the Kansas City Star. His columns appear on Thursday morning. Gwen Grant is president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Johnson County civic leader and columnist Steve Rose joins us this evening. It's always a pleasure to have you here, Steve. Thank you. And I'm Mike Shannon with no discernible skills. With due deference to the Marine Corps, a group of Kansas Cityans are adopting the slogan, Kemper Fi. They question the wisdom of demolishing 38-year-old Kemper Arena, as the American Royal hopes to do. The Royal's opinion may count for more because it has the lease that runs through 2045. Kemper in the city's West Bottoms has languished since the opening of the Sprint Center downtown. The Royal hopes to replace Kemper with a 5,000-seat Coliseum-like structure to house year-round livestock, horse, and trade shows. Those who want to save Kemper are described as primarily architects, preservationists, and some longtime American Royal supporters. So some American Royal leaders are quoted as asking, where were these folks when the Sprint Center was being proposed? Is that a reasonable question, Gwen? Not really. I think that um, at the time that the Sprint Center was being proposed, I actually was on the uh, Modessa Commission and a TIF commissioner at, at that time. And there was discussion and concern about the future of Kemper Arena under the circumstances, but it was uh, the opportunity to develop downtown and have the Sprint Arena downtown just, you know, trumped all of that. And I think the challenge going forward is uh, for Kemper Arena is for uh, those who wish to see some to preserve that facility, they have to come with a, a more comprehensive strategy for actually desert, uh, uh, developing the entire area. I mean, you have Kemper Arena, Arena sitting down here in the in the livestock district, and there's not much else there to uh, draw traffic. And I think the American Royal plan to uh, turn the facility into a coliseum makes sense because you you know they have a focus that that fits with that that area. If they can figure out how to do that and preserve the historical, uh, you know, the landmark of the facility, the architectural design, all of those things are really are important. But developing, uh, bringing in, uh, uh, putting a facility there that speaks to the needs of the American Royal, which is historic to this region, I think is important. I think I'm glad to see that the Kempers want to raise money to help with the development, but with only raising $10 million, it's not going to be enough. So there's a lot of work yet to be done. The Kempers were all in favor of building this new facility, were they not? And offering to raise a million dollars, $10 million to do that? Well, yeah, that'd be great, except it's probably going to be 60 or 70 yeah. or $80 million dollars <laughs> time to get done. Um, first of all, I, mean, I covered this, yeah. you know, back in the mid-2000s, and is downtown better because Sprint Center's there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is Kansas City better? Yes. Is it a better facility than Kemper? Yes. All the right decisions were made. Sorry. Sorry, Kemper. Now, the supporters back then, and I had a colleague who wrote at the time, she, she would rather keep Kemper Arena. I, you know, think it's a fine facility, but it's not something that we're going to reuse that much. So if these architectural people and preservationists, American Royal supporters really want to redo something down there, they're going to have to come with a plan well, to raise privately 60 or 70 million It, it needs a rationale to exist it, it, other yeah. than it's an impressive it, it, exactly. building right. with exactly. unique architectural structure. Well, here's, here's the rationale. I mean, we, I think everyone in the metro area needs to refocus on the fact that the American Royal and that place needs to be here or it'll be somewhere else because we are the center of agricultural, we, we ought to continue to be the center of agricultural culture in the country. And not just for certain kinds of shows, but for barbecues and all the other kinds of events that are there. And you see what other cities are building and 
we, the city needs to get with it and get with the American Royal and, and develop something that fits. That facility was built for a basketball team, just as the Sprint was not well, built I, for I, the American Royal. The, the Kemper Arena was built for, primarily to retain the, the, American the American Royal, Royal the and the Future Farmers the Association. Uh, but the, the American Royal says that they would like to have a 5,000 seat arena mm -hmm. and I think that if that's what they want they're the ones with the least till 2045 50, 50, right I think that they're the ones that ought to get what they want and I exactly. think they should blow up Kemper Arena and start over <laughs> and up. find the 60 million dollars that's needed because if it's a priority for the city to keep the American Royal happy and to keep that area vital they will find the money to do it there's no I don't think there's is question. that a critical issue for the city government uh, no. no not really <laughs> no. I mean you know you have American World Arena down there too I mean there yeah. is an arena yeah, already right. down there that we taxpayers spent more than 20 some odd million dollars on uh, so well, it's inadequate you know, to the task well that's... you know the American Royal is not that great of an event anymore Mary let's let's got to be real honest be. here <laughs> that the American Royal you know <laughs> we can oh we're so great at agriculture well it's it, not that great of an event anymore it's a it's a nice event for Kansas City and I would like to keep it. I would love to keep it, but it's not where the future is for Kansas City. Well, I probably just, another discussion of the time. Well, it could, just could made be all American all the time. But I but think I think you're wrong about that in terms of okay. what we're doing with animal health and all the other agricultural related some big five of the Kansas, Greater what, Kansas City uh, Chamber of Commerce. What you we, don't have, though, Mary, is a comprehensive strat a strategy right. That's what to address it. all Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. So I agree with the you. way it's coming out now, you're just talking about one building. There's no plan that addresses the entire area Not yet. to make it a regional destination that promotes animal health. Well, I'd like to see somebody on the city council of we Kansas City pick that. up this. Uh, uh, under uh, whose jurisdiction does this ultimately fall? The Who? city. The city the government city. of Kansas City, yeah. Missouri. Yeah, because it's a city building. Troy yeah. Schulte. Well, wasn't it reasonably assumed that the acquisition, the creation of the Sprint Center came about because Kemper no longer served that function very well? Yeah, and the people who were, quote, supporters of Kemper, I think, were ducking under their tables at the time that Sprint was out there because no, all the civic leadership was behind well, Sprint. And I don't think that anybody wanted to step forward at that time and say, no, I don't think that's a great thing to do. We want to keep right. old, old right. Kemper. But another piece, another thing is we needed some type of an arena downtown to truly develop mm -hmm. downtown. I mean, we put the sports complex out on I-70. We put uh, the uh, Kemper down in the, in, in the stockyards and just lacked but, the vision of what it we takes also, to we all, sustain economic we development. We also and believe that they downtown. would manage Kemper and that they would schedule events yeah. into yeah, Kemper. That, and, that, yeah. and that didn't happen. Yeah, because really, who, when, the, when we, given a choice, you're going to choose Sprint. We have to leave the Kemper. West Bottoms. <laughs> a Kansas City area law enforcement official says talk of gun control is like unilateral personal disarmament and that our founding fathers are likely spinning in their graves. Furthermore, Johnson County Sheriff Frank Denning, writing on his official website, declared, I will never support nor advocate for any legislation at any level that would restrict the legal possession or ownership of any type of firearm by lawful, law-abiding, tax-paying citizens of Johnson County, Kansas, and of the U.S. of A. Also, a recent study of high school and college students shows that 60% say they plan to own a gun when they have their own homes, or at least will be thinking about it. So, would you say Sheriff Denning and the nation's youth cited in that survey are reasons for hope or reasons for alarm, Steve Rose? I don't know what's come over Frank Denning, uh, <laughs> frankly. Uh, he, Frank, frankly. Is, Frank is a, is a moderate. Uh, he was up, as you'll recall, in a primary election in 2010 against a very right-wing candidate, and uh, the Kansas Chamber of Commerce and the, and the Koch brothers and all that tried to knock Frank Denning out of office. He won just by a squeaker. Uh, he's been known to be a moderate. I don't understand where this has come from. It's like throwing red meat to somebody. I've never seen a, a, a person you know, do a 180 like this. But I did do that. I, I made a call to John Douglas, who's the chief of police of Overland Park and has been there for 17 years as chief, and just to ask him for his reaction to it. Interestingly, he said, he, while he thinks that assault weapons belong in the hands of the military and the police only, he said it's too late to ban assault weapons at this point. So the million, the horse is out of the barn, and the millions of assault weapons that are already out there, he said, it's just, it's just a waste of time to, uh, to but, ban. So 
I was looking for contrast, and I found that they're singing from the same hymn book, actually. Wow. Uh, well, Sheriff Denning has not failed to execute any law, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But isn't it rather shocking, and I think you talk about it in your column this morning, mm -hmm. that somebody whose sworn duty is to enforce the law says, I'm not going to enforce any law, well, essentially, well, no, with he, which no, I disagree. He didn't say he, didn't say he, didn't he say would that. enforce. Actually, so, well, not support. Well, not no, support. No. That's, a, that's a key. So he will are, enforce. Because there are two sheriffs in Missouri right now, uh, kind of, you know, uh, the, the, the kooks in Missouri, <laughs> where, well, we're not going to, they said that, we are not going to enforce anything Obama does on the Second Amendment. Right. I mean, you know, they ought to be kicked out of office. They ought to be impeached. You know, throw them in jail for, I don't know. I mean, if you're going to be a law enforcement officer, there are going to be a lot of laws you may not agree with, but you need to enforce them, whether it's city passing, the county passing, federal government passing. Now, Frank did not say that. Now, I was, Steve, the quibble I'd have with your comment and maybe the Overland Park Chiefs is he also said, and I won't have any problem uh, saying I support high capacity magazine sales and, you know, let, let's keep those wow. going. You know, I, and I know those are using assault weapons and all that stuff, but I, I think that was the thing that struck me is, you know, here's supposed to be Johnson County. You know, we're all we're all kind of moderate we're out here, kind of and they're not. <laughs> but you're, and, and you're, I think, you're, I think your column suggests that, that Johnson County is not all that moderate these days. No, I don't is, think they are. It is moving. I think he appealed. I, I mean, with Steve's comments, I think they he kind of learned from his uh, mistake two years. Not mistake, his race two years Frank ago. Denning, Frank Denning actually is my. I mean, he he takes my phone calls, and we have chats about things every six months or so. And I think. I think that whenever somebody in public office makes a really strange uh, shift in their point of view or what you would expect them to uh, believe or say, you can expect that there might be a job or a lobbying wing or mm -hmm. some kind of, uh, right. of a relationship with Sam Brown he he's or not the running NRA. For, he's not running for real life. There you go. He might be looking for what his next job will be. Secondly, uh, he didn't say that he wouldn't enforce the law. Right. Now, right. given the fact that at the Long Branch Saloon we had a guy with a loaded gun shoot his wife <laughs> about yes. three or four weeks God. ago. <laughs> and, you know, so you wonder, <coughs> is, is this really good for Johnson County's image to have the sheriff? we got guns going off in prominent well-attended yeah. restaurants. Really and the sheriff says he's going to support. So, I mean, just so making the statement as a law enforcement ne Never supporting doesn't mean the same as never enforcing. That's right. Well, well yeah, but you can't. know, it's, uh, it's such a yeah. thin line, though. I know. I mean, it's not it's a wrong it's, thing to say, but he's yeah, not going to allow that part. people with uh, semi-automatic weapons walking around this, and walking into public buildings. Uh, if he wouldn't enforce a change in that, then he need to go. Steve, with the issue of school shootings looming so large in the news, does it surprise you this survey about uh, high school and college students saying uh, they would likely own a gun or think about it when they become homeowners? Well, I think with all the publicity of all the crimes that we've had, even, even though crime is down if, overall in this country, you wouldn't know that by watching the media, by watching the news, by watching the movies, by watching the, everything else that's violent. Uh, I think that they have the same reaction that I had when I, my house was robbed and the second time it was being robbed they were breaking into the glass in my house and I didn't have anything to protect myself and I went out the next day and bought a pistol. And I think that, that kids see all of this going around them and they want to feel better about having that, that protection in their house. I'm going to wrap this up with uh, showing you a classic moment from the battle over gun control <laughs> in the United States. From my cold, dead hands. <laughs> that was Charlton Heston during his tenure as president of the National Rifle Association. Sounded like the voice of Moses reading <laughs> the Ten Commandments. The Jackson County Executive is not offering a penny for your thoughts. He's offering some thoughts for your penny, a new penny sales tax. Mike Sanders is talking about what he calls the largest infrastructure and public improvements project in the county's history. It's a transit plan that includes rails, trails, bikes, and buses. Plan would cover all of Jackson County and cost an estimated $650 million. And that's a lot of pennies. So what about this plan? Is it something Sanders is committed to seeing through, Mary? Oh, definitely. I think that, that what the plan is for the next few weeks and months, Mike, is, is extremely important. I mean, Mike is committed to, to many things, but the first of which is that there would be no surprises 
in this plan. He is he has studied this issue intensely. And for example, Denver, you know, they they went to the people asking for support, and then back come the railroads and other uh, important players and say, oh no, we gave you an estimate about how much it would cost, but uh, guess what? It's two or three times that. So he wants all the major deals that must be struck to, in order to get this really giant he, project. He wants those things finalized before he going to voters, right? done before it happens. And his goal is to take the project to, uh, to, to get this done, these deals done before March and perhaps early April. However, the, the goal for voting on it, he wants in August because anything can go wrong and federal money will be sort of available between now and then, and that's really significant. You've got to move along. Uh, you, you talk about taxes a lot and, yeah. and how high they are yeah. in Kansas City, Missouri. You think Kansas Cityans, Jackson Countyans, are willing to go another uh, full one cent? Well, the, the pro side would be people love sales taxes. I mean, they approve them <laughs> for everything, and they have. I mean, when I started covering this 25 years ago, we were in the 5 and 6 percent. Now we're in the 8 and 9 percent range. So people have adopted sales taxes for a lot of different things, the zoo and all, all kinds of different things. Um, the con side is it is getting pretty high. I mean, it's going to be over 9 percent in Jackson County. I, I would say very quickly that to actually get something passed, you have to have these ironclad agreements. And Mike's been working on them for months and months and months. And railroads are bears to work with. And so if he strikes a deal with them, as Johnson County found out, That's exactly, the railroads will yeah. screw you if they can. And I'm afraid that if you know he tries to go in August and they say, well, you know, you have to sign this deal or we're going to go away, Jackson County taxpayers are the ones who might well, get screwed. So we have to watch if that. If there's any leader that can manage a, a deal with the railroads and make it stick, I'd I, hope I would hope so. The concept of a commuter rail <laughs> makes the most sense of any kind of mass it transportation. Does, yeah. The rail is already there. Mm -hmm. It right. makes a lot of sense. Right. They looked at it in Johnson County along the I-35 mm -hmm. corridor. I thought it was a good idea then, and I think this is a good idea now. How do you like the uh, starter line for the streetcar system? You pretty excited about it? <laughs> um, I'm anxious to see how they're going to raise the funds to go across the river. Yeah. In the North Kansas. Talking about expanding yeah, it now. Well, yeah. uh, there, there's some talk, and I don't know if it's accurate or not, about already uh, cost overruns. Uh, the cost of the project is going to exceed what has been for, for initially which announced. Which one? Starter, which, which starter, which starter line. On the streetcar? Yeah. No, you know, they, uh, Mike, um, one of the uh, uh, council, Russ Johnson, has said they put in like, I think it's like a $20 million, mm -hmm. a very, very hefty contingency fee. To take care of something like that because this is they're going to be ripping up utility lines that have been there forever so i, I don't know i you haven't got to got to wrap it up but, but would you agree that, that there are so many of these things going on and the details are so sketchy well, that it really is hard for the general public Mike, to follow in any detail well yeah but eventually if there's something on the ballot we will get details about it, which is good i mean that would be very but good but this serves right. people that haven't been included before mike yeah. the eastern yeah. jackson county cities more and more powerful all the time southeast too the nation's first black president is beginning his second term. Barack Obama took the oath of office on the same day Americans observe the holiday set aside to honor the late civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In his inaugural address, the president sounded a familiar theme, we're all in this together. For the American people can no more meet the demands of today's world by acting alone than American soldiers could have met the forces of fascism or communism with muskets and militias. No single person can train all the math and science teachers we'll need to equip our children for the future or build the roads and networks and research labs that will bring new jobs and businesses to our shores. Now, more than ever, we must do these things together as one nation and one people. And he sounded a partisan note that seemed to harken back to the 2012 campaign. We recognize that no matter how responsibly we live our lives, any one of us, at any time, may face a job loss or a sudden illness or a home swept away in a terrible storm. The commitments we make to each other through Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, these things do not sap our initiative, they strengthen us. They do not make us a nation of takers. They free us to take the risks that make this country great. 
Well, we all know uh, President Obama is a superb public speaker, but was the inauguration speech a superb speech? Well, in a few seconds, um, Mary and Gwen will go all giddy and tell you <laughs> it was just great. It was just amazing, and it was so enthusiastic, and they loved it so much. And I will tell you that I thought it was fine. It was okay. It was not an amazing <laughs> speech. Fewer people watched it. Fewer people were there. All understandable because it was not 2009. Um, I thought there were a couple lines that will resonate with people. The climate change line, mm. hey, that's pretty big. The line about the gay, uh, his support for gay rights, I think that was a good First one. time any president ever mentioned gay rights in the yeah. inaugural address. So, so I think that, was that, that, that will resonate. And finally, the uh, Social Security line you just heard there, which is, you know, these entitlements, which a lot of people get because they paid for them, Republicans. Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> that is something that can help bind our nation together. All these people who are disabled and get Social Security payments, they're not over 65. Some of them are in their 40s and 50s. They need that help. It's great that we as a nation can do that. Now, you, you know, this was not the State of the Union, where he's supposed to lay out, I'm here's good. how I'm going to balance the budget. He didn't talk about the I'm budget, good. which is a huge thing right now. But no, I didn't think it was a great now, speech. Be before kind of Gwen and Mary go giddy, yes. I want to ask Steve a question. Uh, some of the observers, some, some analysts said this was the most liberal speech ever given by a president at an inaugural. Do you agree? I mean, just from yeah, your uh, From all the inaugurals history, I've seen, yeah. I would have to say this is the most More liberal. liberal than Reagan. And I thought it was fairly, <laughs> I thought it was pretty arrogant in the sense that he did not reach out at all to the Republicans yep. to the other side of the, of the mm. aisle. And I thought that he had plenty of opportunity to do that. And he just pretty much, he's pretty, he's pretty cocky these days and pretty much just lay out his program his way and uh, didn't make any gesture to the well, other side. Well, well, okay, we we're getting close we to the end of the Gwen, Gwen, hang on a second. We're getting close <laughs> to the end of the segment. I got a final question for you two, and, and be brief. Uh, there's an argument now about whether Obama is a pragmatist or an ideologue based on that address. How do you define him? Is he pragmatic or is he hmm. ideological? I think he's pragmatic. I don't say, you know, I, 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 that ideologue thing, I think he has a great vision for this country, but he's also very pragmatic about how to uh, to achieve it. Pragmatist, Mary. Well, I would have to say to Yale, uh, not only am I not going to go giddy, I think at, at looking at that speech and looking at the phrase that came before the one that you played, Mike, where he said, we don't believe in this country that that freedom is for the lucky and happiness is for the few. That was based upon his beautiful framing of the meaning of the Declaration of Independence. It was as eloquent and substantive and as finely crafted an inaugural speech since FDR, which, by the way, was the most liberal speech ever given for, by a president. And, and, and a recurring theme was <laughs> a, a, a recurring yes. Go ahead. He reached out uh, to we, the entire... No, not, not you. Go ahead. Mike, go ahead. A recurring theme was we the people. He built on that. <laughs> and uh, we the panelists are getting ready for roast and toast because <laughs> that time has now arrived where each of our panelists, each Ruckett, speaks up and speaks out about people and issues in the news. And we begin tonight with Mary. Well, there is a preacher from uh, Leewood, Kansas, uh, Adam Hamilton, the Reverend Adam, Adam Hamilton from the Church of the Resurrection, United Methodist Church, that has 18,000 members. And President Obama invited him and his people invited him, believe it or not, to be the principal speaker, speaker at the National Prayer Breakfast the day after the inauguration. He was fabulous. 1,500 people in his uh, community watched it live. Uh, in Leewood. And what he said was, Mr. President, we got to find common ground and you're the man to do it. Good for you, Reverend Hamilton. Uh, well, this is a roast to the NCAA and its involvement in the whole MU basketball program right now. Look, somebody has to help clean up the cesspool that is too often college sports. And the NCAA has the power to do that and has often in the past done it. I hope to get this problem cleaned up because we need a strong incredible NCAA. A lot of conservatives are squirming in their seats these days because uh, Governor Sam Brownback, who slashed income taxes, is now fixing that by revenue increases, by keeping the sales tax, knocking out the home mortgage deduction, and then yesterday announcing, surprise, the property tax deduction would also go away. People thought that he was going to slash the budget 
cut expenses. <laughs> so I don't know if this is a roast or toast, but I'll say that he certainly is surprising a lot of people. This is a salute to uh, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton for the brilliant manner in which she handled the congressional hearings on yesterday and certainly set the stage to run for the office of president for four years from now. And finally, it seems we're on a bit of a roll. Last week, I mentioned a positive reference to ruckus on the Tony's Kansas City website. This week, our toast and thanks to John Landsberg and his popular website, The Bottom Line, for a kind overview of ruckus. If you'd like to read the story, you can find it by going to bottomlinecom.com, one word. It's a great site for information <laughs> about what's happening in the local media. And maybe... Maybe someday there will be a story about ruckus in the Kansas City Star. It's too bad we don't know anyone who has influence there. And that's ruckus for this week. More local public affairs discussions coming up Friday at 7.30 with Nick Haynes and Kansas City Week in Review. And now on behalf of the Ruckettes and the Ruckus crew, I'm Mike Shannon. Thanks very much for watching and good night. Production underwriting for Ruckus has been made possible in part by the generous contributions from Fred and Lou Hartwig and from viewers like you. Thank you.